to put signage up that this is a private dock or something like that, um, just to avoid that misconception. Because if we're going to authorize people to use it because it's on public land, then we're going to need to properly inspect them. Thanks, Matt. Understand. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Joe. Yep. Okay, so making rules if it's not our if it's not our under our authority, uh, why are we worried about it? Like, I, let because, them go ahead. I mean, yeah. if there's going to be an issue, uh, the issue will be uh, obviously uh, it won't take very long for the issue to come our way if if we have if there's any threat to us. Yeah. So then the option would be that you direct administration to do nothing on this item. And then when someone requests our consent, I'll say this is not something we're going to do. Well, I think we stay out of it. I mean, you know how many docks are out there? You want to start, to, we, we'll need a whole new department. Dock Kevin, inspections. Isn't, we don't, isn't yeah. the whole thing, yeah. Matt, is, is it not that they need permission from the county so they can get the permit from the province? That, that's it. Because in most cases, we're the landowner adjacent to the water. They need our consent to do it. So we can't stay out of it. So we just need it. We need a blanket letter stating that it's, and they've got to post it private doc and they've got to do this. And the, the four things we just talked about, they come in, they sign it. That's their permission slip. Go to the province, get your dock, and have fun this summer. I, okay. I don't think we have any other option unless we do want to start inspecting them and do this and do that, and I don't think we want to start that. Do we? I don't know. No. So, okay, can we get a motion then? Because let's just get a motion and he come right, drafts up a blanket letter and... Uh, George, okay. All in favor? Against? Okay. There you go, Matt. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Public works now. A1. There's a letter in front of us from Tischucks. Um, yeah, I have no problem with that at all. For them to use that road allowance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eve. I just add a little context here if you need. Um, yeah, if you want, Greg. So, okay. so this came to us uh, from uh, Tischuk Construction, who's doing the, the work on the wild water line. Uh, he's identified that Range Road 40, uh, just north of uh, Township 540, as an area where he could uh, we, he would have room to put a couple of uh, drilling mud recovery tanks. Um, his uh, discussion with him this morning, he's worried that that location, it, it will work if he just needs the two tanks there because there's nice elevation drop. He can dump his, his truckers into the, the tanks quite easily. But if he has to bring in a centrifuge, there may not be room, but he's not sure. So he's asked that a, a second site also uh, that we put forward to him, which was the Darwell Firewall Fire Hall Yard, that there may be some potential there. But uh, his first site of choice would be this Range Road 40. Yeah, I got no problem with either myself. That's, uh, yeah, I think whatever they need. Okay. So just, you want a motion for that? Um, Probably, eh? Yeah, just yeah so I think that would be best if... Yeah. One question. Sorry, uh, Greg. One question in regards to uh, actually environmental protection. Yeah. Well, what they're they're going to have all their policies and procedures in place with regards to any kind of spillage or any kind of release. Is is that correct? Is that part of the process and part of the um, how could I say the the ongoing dealings with with district in this case? Yeah, they would have a, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Nick. Um, they do have to adhere to all the Alberta environment standards and they would have a policy within their contract to wild water and how they deal with all their drilling fluids. 
and uh, and that's part of what he's doing here is by having these tanks he strips out his solids reuses his water and then uh, uh, ex- disposes his solids at an appropriate site so all that still pertains and if there's a spillage uh, there's there's many regulatory requirements that pertain to him as well okay thank you yeah just on a side note that's the biggest bunch of bullshit that these guys have to go through because it's dirt yep that's all it is is dirt but anyway george i take it this uh, these are all going to be probably uh broomed in in the whole shot that's for environment reasons greg uh, yes, uh, I'm, he would have to provide some, uh, how would I put it, uh, contingency for if there's spillage that he can contain it, and that's all part of his standard requirements as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I need a motion. Nick? I'll move. Okay, all in favor? I'll move. Sure. Against? Okay. There you go, Greg. Thank you. Uh, okay, infrastructure. Proposed renaming of the Marathorpe Airport. Who wants to speak on this? Ross? Lloyd? Uh, yeah, in discussions uh, that we've had over the past uh, little while. Uh, we thought that it would be a nice gesture to consider renaming the Marathorp Area Airport, uh, the Peter Trenchy Airport, uh, just in the fact that he provided a lot of uh, input into the Black St. Anne White Court constituency, Black St. Anne County itself, and the Marathorp Area. So, uh, Basically, it's a county-owned airport, and uh, I think it would be good to see what would be required to uh, rename the airport as suggested. Okay, I like the idea. We're on. Um, okay, do we want a motion for... Let's just have a motion for administration to... Uh, to look in to to get to get the ball rolling, I guess. Whatever. I don't know what we have to do to rename an airport. So okay. I'm prepared to make that motion to have uh, administration look into the requirements to re- rename the Marathorpe Airport to the Peter Trenchy Airport or whatever name uh, appropriate name with respect we decide on. Okay. All in favor. Okay. Against? <laughs> All right. Letter to Wildwater from the county. I can speak to this, Mr. Chair. Uh, this here, I was asked to bring this here to try and, uh, or to send a letter to Wildwater to look at trying to get the water line on phase four uh, to the hamlet of uh, Rich Valley, uh, which in return then would uh, look at supplying the school of Rich Valley with water from there and possibly a truck fill. Okay. No, that's good. And what's, do we want a motion to, for that letter? Is that what we're after? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. George, okay, all in favor? Sweet. Can I speak to that? Uh, uh, sure. Okay. That, uh, Joe, um, that is uh, going to be a separate application, though, correct? I no, guess we, we can, yes. Um, it has to be because it's over, the, over that okay. side. Okay. So what we're going to have to do is uh, we're going to have to, and I think we've got it on our major project list, did we not uh, in, uh, put that on? Uh, yes, because it, you know, it's uh, it's right now. It's there is an approval out uh, on the footprint. Now to get uh, that extension on that approval, 
you know, it's not a reroute or it's, this is, uh, um, this is a brand new line. So we should, and, but it's new money. If we can get it in, then let's get this in. And then, uh, uh, instead of trying to squeeze money out of, and, and, you know, go back for asking for, uh, uh, another budget, if we could put this in a, as a project. So would you, is Wild going to do that because it would be part of Wild's line or uh, is it going to be under the county? Well, I think, uh, I think send, that, send the letter to Wild with the approvals from uh, uh, Northern Gateway uh, and also uh, from our ag services area out there as well. Because, you know, there, that, that we have no groundwater up there. That's why we're, you know, so we, we and the water that they're uh, providing those kids at the Ritz Valley School isn't very good water. I mean, this was always, you know, it would be great to get that across. But, you know, obviously the costs are going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two million bucks. So, you know, that getting that as an attachment for a separate approval is a lot easier. Because even if we put a change order in, we still have to put a, a you know, a, a change of scope and everything else. So you might as well put it in as a, we'll put it in as an application. Okay. We'll let our guys figure no, that out. No, we still need a motion for the letter. So George yeah, has a motion I, I, on no, the floor. I, absolutely. No, no, but I, uh, it's what's included in the letter, Joe. Okay. Well, I'm sure that we'll let okay. you review it. All right. Thank us. you. No problem. I'm totally in favor. Okay, good. All in favor. There we go. Carried. Again, sorry, nothing. Carried. Go ahead. Now, there's another letter, Joe. That's the same one, Mr. Chair. Oh. You guys are just trying to confuse me today, I think. Okay, Sandy Beach Donaway Transmission Line. Okay, Mr. Chair, uh, this is here, uh, as Council is aware, uh, we've been, uh, the Darwell Lagoon Commission has uh, been approved for Phase A of the Regional Wastewater Transmission Line from Sandy Beach to Onaway Lagoon. Um, we've looked at this, um, we've uh, got some scenarios in the um, attachment here that shows the routing of this uh, water or sewer line down to Onaway. Uh, we're looking at possibly trying to pick up as many of our subdivisions from this location uh, to kind of take care of the um, whole Sturgeon River watershed area um, in the future. We don't know where the requirements from Alberta Environment are gonna take us, but uh, so we've tried to accommodate this line to come through the county and try and catch the bulk of the population in that whole Sturgeon River area. Um, so we're looking at, uh, we've got some scenarios here. Uh, we've presented to Sandy Beach and Sunrise Beach, uh, four different scenarios for this project as it's about a $9 million project. Um, so we're looking at, uh, as you can see, uh, alternatives there for cost sharing. It's a third, a third, a third, scenario one. Scenario two is uh, based on uh, population and per lot costs, uh, a percentage there, 48% Sandy Beach, 25% Sunrise, 25% Lac-Saint-Anne County. Uh, scenario three again is 39% Sandy Beach, 21% Sunrise Beach, and 39% Lac-Saint-Anne County. And scenario four is uh, with us being the, the bigger ownership of this project, um, you can see 32% for Sandy Beach, 17% for Sunrise, and 50.1% for Lac-Saint-Anne County. Uh, in, there is a column um, in there that shows what each dollar figures would be involved on each scenarios. Um, we are recommending that 
Laxinan County becomes the bigger owner of this project for future um, in this area, which would be roughly uh, 450,000. Steve? Yeah, Joe, do you have a projection of county residents that would be using that line five, 10 years from now? Yes, there is, Steve. Uh, it is attached there. Uh, there's over 350 residents that could be possibly using this line. And then with the, an opportunity for growth. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Factoring a three and a half percent or 2% growth over yeah. five or 10. Yeah. Okay. And just want to make sure yeah. we get value for our contribution. Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we may not see it in the next 10 years, but um, I think it's a, a good way to have uh, a good voice on that line, the control uh, as a bigger owner and look after our residents within our county. George, Joe. Okay. Joe, George, um, is that ever in the future any consideration of uh, running that line up towards our Northeast Lagoon that's going to capture in Ackerman and all those other ones? That is, uh, um, no, George, that is a different project. Um, but that's that what is, I mean, though, in the future, though, that yes. that ever, that's been looked at? Yes, we've just okay. updated the costs on that project, and we're looking at applying under the ICIP grant right now for, it's about a $31.2 million project, that one, with the County of Barhead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Lauren? Yeah, I, I think it's a great project. I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the numbers, though, that you're talking about, the percentages, that's of the ten percent contribution, not of the 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 nine million Correct. dollars. This is, and uh, I should have explained so, that. Yeah. yeah it's okay. 90, just so you, I, I I'm not there. I I didn't. I just wanted to make sure that those numbers are quite. Uh, you're not going to get infrastructure programs. The government's committed to it to get these uh, projects out, so people are out working again. So uh, I'm sure that uh, this is going to move ahead very quickly. The uh, receiving station, Joe. I believe we can work it out with the water station because the truck fill were in negotiations for land at that location. So probably one access to the highway uh, for both uh, systems. Correct. Okay, done. Yeah, I think when the, I think when the, we start talking about the phase B two and the, um, and then that Nakaman. Lachlan online, I think when it comes down to that on the 10%, I think we always want to be the bigger owner of all of them. So nobody can, we don't have a little 100 population summer village trying to tell us what we're going to, who we're going to let on it and who we're not down the road. Lloyd? If you're ready for a motion, I'm prepared to make a motion that we approve option four. Okay, I am. Thank you. All in favor? Oh, can we get included in that motion uh, where we're going to uh, it just be an annual debenture payment or a debenture then? Is that what we're going to look at? Mike? I think the utility pays. J Joe, I thought we talked about using uh, wastewater reserves for this. Yes, and we can. Yeah. I'd recommend that. Okay. Do you want that included in the motion? Please. Okay, so I'm prepared to add that to the motion, but it come from wastewater reserves. Okay. Good enough. All in favor? Against? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Now, Matthew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, as requested, this is uh, the Q1 results for um, 2020 in terms of planning and development. Um, we initiated seven enforcement um, currently within the quarter one and carried over five enforcements from 29 that are still ongoing where we're trying to deal with the landowners. 
Um, some of the carryover ones have now expired their um, court order deadline and are requiring action, but that's for a discussion at a, a later date. Um, we only had um, six respondents to the, the surveys this time around in Q1. Um, it was only six, per, only six people compared to 41 um, that we had received last time. Overall, um, people were still satisfied with the information that we required and that they provided. Um, the majority this time around actually met with staff before um, before they submitted their applications, which is 110% increase from last time. Um, most of the things are all positive. Um, there was two surveys that were identical in nature, and they we're focused particularly on business licenses and particularly the billing process for that. Um, so the way it, it works is we don't prorate our business license um, application and someone would came in and established a business license in the later part of the year and then got an invoice in the February of the next year for the new license. Um, and the other concern was that if someone submits a, a check or a business license application before um, we've closed off the previous year, that just sits in the vault and isn't processed until we carry over our system. And so people had concerns that they had to put in this application and then they still ha hadn't had the check clear and they weren't sure if they had a license or not. Um, but going through all the applications, um, the, the two or three things that stood out to me was people want the ability for electronic payments. Um, they want more checklists on the process. Um, and so that is one of our um, strategic plan items that we're working in conjunction with Tangent on. Um, they felt um, that some of the application processes were duplication. Um, some people don't understand the difference between the development permit and the building permit. Um, one authorizes the placement of a structure on the property and the other one outlines the um, building it is safe by Alberta building code standards. Um, the other thing that complaints we received was people should be able to extend development permits. Um, and this is a result of us doing enforcements on people that haven't complied with permit conditions. Um, in regards to economic development, we've had a couple of inquiries about new, uh, new campgrounds and event centers at various egg properties across the county. Um, there has been no new interest in commercial or industrial lands in, in quarter one. Um, we did just receive, this is more quarter two though, um, some more documentation on that proposed um, facility at Rochford. Um, and as I get more information, I'll provide that accordingly. Um, but the, the one main thing that keeps coming up is development continues to be based on where the developers have found land. Um, there hasn't been any concentrated interest on specific municipal hubs. It tends to be they found a property they liked or a deal that they like, and they want to know if they can get their business or their development approved there. Um, in quarter one, we only had two subdivision applications um, as opposed to in 2019 where we had six. One was a lot line adjustment and the other was for a subdivision in division three. Um, okay. Any questions? Okay, do you want to get a motion to accept Matt's report as information, please? Nick, all in favor? Against? Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Next. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an ICF between Sunrise Beach and the county. Um, it's the standard template that we developed for all of our summer villages. Um, they have agreed in principle and we're requesting a motion that 
it be approved as presented. Okay. Nick. Nick moves that it's uh, accepted as presented. All in favor? Against? Okay. And I take it yellow, yellow stone's the same thing, eh? Uh, yes, sir. So I need a motion for Yellowstone. Ross, all in favor? Against? Carried. All right, now, um, I guess we need a motion to go into MPC. Yes, Mr. Chair. Lloyd, all in favor? Against? Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, an application to approve to create two 40-acre parcels and one 45-acre parcel and one 18-acre parcel. Um, we are recommending it that that it be approved, uh, given the conditions attached. The two or three items that I would like to note is it is adjacent to our lagoon. And there are some development setback prohibitions on the property as a result of that. Um, as such, there is a condition in the, the, the condition number 10. It states that a caveat be placed on title to notify landowners that certain locations have prohibitions on construction as a result of site-specific factors and environmental setbacks, including but not limited to water wells due to its proximity of the regional landfill. Um, so this on the title, there will be um, on the property to the, the south, the southernmost property, there will be a pro, uh, there will be a caveat put on title, um, limiting what they can do based on the regulations for having a setback really adjacent to um, a lagoon. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, can we get a motion then uh, for the recommendation? George, okay, all in favor? Okay, again, sorry, nobody. Go ahead, there you go, Matt. Thank you. And that's it, I can come out of MPC now. That's all you got? Yes, Mr. Chair. We yep. a motion to come out of MPC. George, I'll move. all in favor? Against? Okay. There we go. Community and Protective Services, Agricultural Services. Aaron, are you around? Yeah, I'm. I'm online here. Um, I'm actually in the office, but still just online. Uh, I believe Lorraine is also. Uh, Lorraine Taylor is online as well. Uh, okay. She was going to present this first letter. This was an initiative, or an initiative from. Um, from our conservation department. So, Lorraine, are you on line as well here? Or not? <laughs> um, I, I see, see her. her. Yeah. Um, okay. I can email her. Can we, uh, um, Mr. Chair, can we just move on to the next item and I will try and get Lorraine to to get you online bet. you bet okay um so the second item we have here um, being the uh regulatory changes to the fisheries act for the removal of beaver dams uh, so i've had some discussion with uh with some of the councillors in regards to this and um i guess just how significantly this affects our ability to uh to do business as far as uh, infrastructure protection and uh and I guess the, the flooding issues that we typically see here in the county. Um, basically, what it comes down to is a change of wording um, within the Fisheries Act that removed our ability to uh, self-assess uh, for the purpose of blasting uh, to remove beaver dams. Uh, basically, this is now requires us to submit a complete application that would be similar to any any sort of, um, I guess, significant activity in, in or around potential fish bearing waters, uh, which is a, a huge portion of the waterways within our municipality, um, actually the great majority of them. 
So um, yeah, basically what we're asking here is uh, is to send a letter to uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, including our elected officials as well. Um, I guess just outlining how significant this change is uh, at a municipal level, um, how it could potentially, uh, I guess, cost us on the infrastructure side, and and uh, yeah, and just what a delay like this or you know basically the lack of transparency when this came about how this has affected our day-to-day -day. Uh, we do have a uh, a large amount of water sitting around as everyone knows i mean we came into this winter already in a saturated state and uh, things haven't got better um, with spring runoff we're seeing the typical call volume and concerns that we normally do but we really we've lost the, probably the most significant tool that we had in our toolbox with this uh, regulatory change Okay, unfortunately, we're we're at the mercy of the DFO. But yeah, we need to get a letter out. I agree, hundred percent. So, Steve, you make sense. a motion. We send that. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Okay. And I did talk to uh, Aaron. I did talk to Shane yesterday. Oh, okay. okay. About this, and he wants to get copied in on the letter too, and he will take it to. Jason Nixon, and uh, because it's going to be a province-wide issue, and then they will go to bat for us against the feds too. So, oh, awesome! No, that sounds Good. great. And uh, yeah, I'll send once I get the letter here put together. I'll I'll send a copy around to to council so everyone knows what the what we're the final ask is, and, and we'll go from there. Um, Joel, I I see. Well, Aaron, just, just oh, this go ahead. Nick. Sorry, Nick. This is Nick. Uh, I just want to clarify because I, from what I understand and I know the contact time that you get from from us going ahead and finding an, an issue or a problem to the time DFO is notified to the time this is not just infrastructure this is basically this could be people's property this could be a whole bunch of things that could be involved uh, with and that includes a lot of insurance and so on and so forth so I think I, I know we're aware of it but I think that needs to be made premise too that uh, you know, this is not just <laughs> taking away our ability to do the work, but it's our it takes away our ability to protect uh, the residents of the county here. Uh, ab absolutely, um, I fully agree with that, and and you can sure see that um, in a lot of the phone calls we've been taking through our um, through Intercon, like our dispatch agency. They uh, like a lot of these rate pairs, they're they're desperate as the you know uh, there is a large or significant amount of water um, moving right now and and with our hands tied i agree nick like we're looking or these landowners are potentially looking at insurance issues or you know permanent damage um yeah it's it, it's significant for everyone yeah if we could help them with any kind of cost so us aaron if we uh put in an application what about what would be the timelines for them to get back to us yes or no uh so there's been no no confirmation on a timeline uh just historically when we've done applications for for other projects it's been it's been very significant there's uh um if if this if this timeline looks like other projects we may not see uh, an answer one way or another within this blasting season even so uh, we have reached out to them, um, both our Alice coordinator and uh, and the Ag department, and and just di different staff have made attempts at contact with different personnel at DFO, and and no one will really give us a firm answer as far as a turnaround time. So it, we're, essentially, we can send in these applications, and and we're at their mercy. Um, yeah, there's been no commitment for turnaround. And the number of different beaver dams that bounce up every year would be very significant <laughs> yeah well and, and it, it's a kind of it's a fluid thing right like we're a lot of these decisions are kind of our game day decisions um you know knowing the history of a water course or or what have you but you know there's um yeah it's certainly like it uh, it's not a consistent there wouldn't be a consistent set of applications every year so it's losing that ability to self-assess it uh, it sure makes it challenging or extra challenging Thank you. 
You're, I think you're muted. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can uh, when you send these applications in, do you send in just one at a time, or do you will really you get about half a dozen and send them in? Yeah. Uh, so the first round here, we we sent in ten uh, the applications that were that were deemed, I guess, the highest priority based on on the history we've had for these locations, um, and that's simply for infrastructure protection. And, I guess the historic volume of calls and issues we've had. Uh, it is one at a time and the application is is significant. We spent weeks here gathering information and getting things entered even for these first, uh, first few. Uh, we do have another round uh, set to go of applications set to go out here uh, tomorrow. But uh, yeah, it's it's significant. The application's hugely labor intensive. You're off again. Uh, damn. How many did we do last year, uh, Aaron? How many dams did we go through? Yeah, roughly. Uh, is that have to? Sorry, I don't have the firm number on that right now, but no, it was no, over no. six. It, it was over sixty for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think. Uh, I think we should be. We should actually reach out to our legal guys. And just uh, the implications of somebody losing property or us losing roads might uh, it might be worth us to ask for forgiveness and in, uh, instead of permission. And uh, I think that would be a pretty good battle to to take these guys on in uh, in court, actually, because uh, they're playing with people's livelihoods and they don't understand it because they should be out checking boats with the Coast Guard and leaving us good flatlanders alone. That's what they should be doing. So I would actually talk to legal about that. Steve? Yeah, just I'd like to see us pursue it with legal and see where we're at on uh, doing these dams and protect ourselves. If we need to do it, we've got to do it, but we've got to make sure we're doing it above board. Uh, yeah, you want to add that to your motion? Yes. Okay. Have we voted on that motion? Yeah. Okay. Um, does everybody so sorry, agree with adding that? that? Sorry, sorry to interrupt there, Joe. Uh, I just have some, they actually pulled up the statistics here. So we actually, re we blew 97 dams last year. Uh, we removed, uh, 199 and total and um yeah so roughly about half of them we used we blasted so um yeah 97 were removed uh with dynamite yeah that's significant <laughs> all right okay well let's get that letter put together as soon as we can and get it out and and uh okay. set something up with mike and talk to legal okay Will do. Uh, Thank you. Lorraine, you're around now, I hear. I hope so. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. All right. Um, yes, I'm just presenting a letter of support for the Agriculture and Lot Extension Society. Uh, their goal is to uh, revise and update all of the shelter belt um, Publications that have been available over the years and are now outdated since the um, federal shelter belt program ended. Those publications have not been kept updated. And the uh, Woodlot Extension Society has done a lot of work with landowners on establishing shelter belts, so they would like to combine that information and um, develop updated materials. And so this is simply a letter of support to go along with the grant application that they have made. Okay, and I get a motion that we send this letter of support. George, all in favor? Okay, against. There you go, Lorraine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Aaron, anything else? Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's got it for us for right now. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. I'll get that letter out to, out to council here as soon as we can. Okay.
Okay. Yeah, that would be get it out. We'll get it signed and get it gone. Okay, if that's it, community services. Who do we have with us from the community services department today? You are lucky enough to have Trista. Lucky enough. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering if we could uh, leave B1 until after the audit presentation. Why, did you do something wrong? No, it's just that the auditor will be speaking to the item as well. So. Okay. Perfect. So the next item is the 2019-2020 Play School refunds. And in light of the COVID situation, we needed to cancel the program. Uh, and so this is to ratify administration and providing refunds back to the parents that had already paid for the entire program. Okay. We need a motion. Lloyd, all in favor? Against? There you go. So the next item on the agenda is the municipal campground operations. And again, in relation to COVID-19, we've had some discussions on recommendations on whether we should be opening our campgrounds or not. At this point, the chief medical officer has still not um, released any restrictions on municipal or private campgrounds operating. Uh, however, our recommendation at this point is to delay the opening until June 1st, which will give us some adequate time to put the right preventions in place. Um, to prevent the spread. Okay. Do you want a motion for that? Yes, please. Nick, all in favor? Against? Okay, there you go. Joe, yeah. Just hang on, Joe. I, I'm, it takes a little while to delay here to get this mute on and off. But uh, so, Trista, let's just be clear. This motion is for the county uh, campgrounds solely. That's correct. The municipally operated, so Lassard Lake Public Campground and the Paddle River Dam Campground at this point. Um, and that's just to delay the opening. And then if there's additional um, restrictions or mandatory closures that come in from the chief medical officer, then we would have to address that at some point as well. So this is based on the fact that there is no restriction at this time. But at this point, uh, uh, there is no conditions put on, uh, on private campgrounds. No, I do have that later on in the agenda, but at this okay, point, there's good. not. No, yeah. no, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Outdoor Ed Center. So again, related to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a majority of the uh, rental of the Outdoor Education Center will need to be canceled simply due to the uh, maximum number of people that are permitted at the site um, and so the request is to um, ratify the decision to make exception to the current cancellation refund clause uh, which requires an extended notification um, and to provide refunds to anybody that is required to cancel or wishes to cancel moving forward for this season. Okay, Steve. Yes, uh, I finally got on uh, speak here. Yes, I'd like to uh, be able, or we should be able to refund the money back from the outdoor education uh, uh, if they re request. Okay, all in favor? Against? Carried. Oh okay. My. Anyway, next. <laughs> uh, the Sangato Riverside Campground. So as council will recall, we did put a request for proposals out for the operation of the facility for the 2020 uh, season. And so um, we did discuss the uh, proponents uh, via the a closed session discussion. Um, and so the recommendation is simply to direct administration to continue to negotiate the terms of a lease agreement with the potential proponent that we have selected. Roger. 
Ross. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will move that. Okay. Back to administration. Okay, all in favor? Against? Carried. Okay. I think what we'll do is we'll take a break now, and Curtis will be back at, and we'll come back with him at 11 o'clock for our uh, um, finance or audit, and then we'll be able to finish up some of this other stuff. So there we go. 11 bells. Be back here.
We, uh, we're back live. Lauren, are you with us? Lauren Olsvik, are you with us? You can't hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I'm just putting my mute back on. Okay. What's that? There you go. Okay. Curtis, are you there? You're muted, Curtis, if you are there. Hello? There you go. How are you today? Doing good yourself? Not bad, man. So I'll let you uh, go ahead and run with the show there, Curtis. Okay, thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Curtis Friesen here from Metrics Group. Uh, just here to say a few words about your financial statements and the audit. So uh, as far as the process itself, we were there in December uh, to do some of our preliminary testing. So at that point, we're concerned about just understanding your accounting processes, testing controls over different controls over how you pay the bills, how you process payroll, how you uh, collect and record different types of revenues that you have. Uh, so that part of the process went smoothly. We didn't have any issues or concerns to bring forward in that regard. Then we come back in March and we again do more detailed testing. At that point in time, we're more interested in seeing invoices, agreements, uh, supporting documentation for all the transactions that happened that we want to test. And again, good, good, clean process. All the records we asked for were provided. All of our questions to management that we asked were, were answered. So, so generally speaking, good, good, clean process. Didn't have any issues getting through the audit. So we'll issue an audit findings letter after this, uh, you know, stating some of those facts that auditors are supposed to communicate with councils and boards. Um, every financial statement has some estimates in it. The main ones for you guys are amortization of capital assets, allowance for potential uncollectible receivables. So those are your biggest estimates. We didn't have any issues with those as we went through the through the audit process. Our audit report itself is attached near the front of the sta uh, financial statement. So at this point, I mean, the financial is a draft. Um, 
you know, they were provided to management uh, a while back. They've had a chance to look at them, so they're here before council for for any questions, considerations, but they are a draft until approved. So our audit report is there. The first paragraph is where we talk about our opinion. Um, based on our work, like I said, we're comfortable signing off on the financials that they're a fair and reasonable representation of what happened in 2019. So that's in the first part. And then it goes on to talk about management's responsibility, auditors' responsibilities in the financial reporting process, standard type stuff. Uh, it's, you know, the, the opinion and the report are, are considered a clean opinion with no issues noted. So, so that's the audit side of things. On the financials themselves, I'm going to assume that everybody has access to a copy. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to go to the statement of operations. I'll make a few. I'll make a few comments on the numbers there. So that would be page four of the actual draft financial statement document. Top of the page says statement of operations and accumulated surplus. So again, we're just looking at the revenues and expenses of the county. Uh, middle column is your 2019 actual numbers. We're comparing to 2018. We're also comparing to your budget for 2019. So total revenues, 21.5 million, uh, right in line with your budget, a little bit higher than last year. Your, your net tax revenue went up about 800,000 from about 15.6 million up to 16.4. So you had an increase in assessment, main reason, and a little increase in the tax rate itself. Uh, so anyways, more tax revenue generated there. The rest of the items are, you know, sale and user charges, uh, government grants for operating, very similar. Uh, to your budget and last year. Penalties are up, you'll see that number there, 615,000 compared to last year's 370. Um, again, we have some slow slow pay payment issues and so penalties are going up as a result. Um, so again, revenue 21.5 million, and we get down to the list of expenses. So total expenses 25.6. So some increase over budget in the public works area, just additional road repairs, gravel, uh, you know, was a wetter summer in 2019. So I think that's the main reason those expenses are over budget. Uh, general and admin, so large increase over budget here. The main, really one item being the, the entry made for allowing for potential uncollectible taxes. So 1.3 million was, was what we added to the allowance in 2019. And so that's the main reason you're up over last year and budget in the general and admin category. Other categories are fairly similar to budget and last year. Uh, you know, a ways down the list, you see planning, planning and development. So budget of 970, actual spending of 636. So just some inter-municipal development planning work that didn't get done in 2019 is the main reason you're under budget. So total expenses then 25.6, um, puts you in a deficit of 4.1 at that point. And then to it, we have some other items, uh, revenue items that we add below it. So your government grants for capital. So this is the MSI capital that you get. Uh, we get, and it gets recognized as revenue as you spend it on, on capital activity. Uh, you had some contributed land from developers. So that's an accounting entry, not, not an actual cash transaction, that 399,000. And then you sold some graders and realized a gain on them, so 305 there. So, so 2.3 million of other revenue puts you then in a in a deficit for the year of 1.7. So really, you'd point to that allowance for potential uncollectible taxes as as really being the sole reason for the deficit in the in the current year. So take that off your last year's accumulated surplus of 66.8 puts you at 65.1. So. So that page tells you what happened. If you flip back to what you're looking at, uh, a page earlier, page three is the statement of financial position is what it says at the top. 2019 compared to 2018, this is more a statement of just indicating your where you stand at a certain point in time. So at, at the end of December, um, top of the page there, we're looking at cash in the bank, 3.3 million. So a drop from last year, you know, a variety of reasons for that, but maybe the main one would be you use some of your cash resources to, to pay for capital asset spending in the year. So cash down a bit. Receivables uh, in total, they're less than last year, uh, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, last year you had more grant receivables outstanding, this year you don't have as much, but I'll, I'll point you to a note in a minute uh, with some details on receivables. A loan receivable is primarily the amount owing from Laxine and Foundation, so uh, just regular repayments being made there. Long-term investments, just over a million bucks, that's your GICs with uh, that are earning interest around 2.1 to 2.5%. So no, not much change there. 
So financial assets, 11.9. Financial liabilities, just your regular payables, deposits, uh, unspent grants is, is your deferred revenue. Those items are all very similar to, to last year. Your long-term debt, uh, 4.2 million. So it didn't ch change much in total. Uh, you paid down one loan and then you took on some debentures for some new debentures, but at the end of the day, you've, you're ending up in a, in a similar position. And again, two million of that debt relates to the Laxanan Foundation. So really, you guys have, have very low amounts of debt. Net financial assets, then 2.7 million. And then we get into the non-financial, which is your inventory on hand, uh, similar, primarily gravel, uh, prepaid expenses, and then uh, tangible capital assets, the big numbers. So 60.5 million is what we started with on the books. Added 4.7 uh, million primarily capital road work, bridge work, some tower spending, and three graders were purchased. So those are your bigger items that went into your capital assets. And then every year we record amortization. Uh, so 4.7 million was added, and then amortization of 4 million offsets it. So ending up at 61.2 on the books. And at the bottom of the page there, then the difference is your accumulated surplus, 65.1 million. So those are the main two pages of the statement. I just want to highlight a few other items in the document. So if you're looking, we'll get you all the way to page 11. Just wanna make a few comments there. This, I always like this statement, it's just a different way of looking. Like we mentioned, we have total spending of 25.6 million and that's always done by function. And this page just shows you those same expenses, but by object. So it's the one place where you can go and see what did we spend on salaries, wages and benefits in total. So you see there at the top of the list, $8 million, which is almost identical to last year's number. Realized the savings from your budget, you know, just uh, unfilled positions or, or savings realized in a variety of, of categories, assessment, agriculture, public works and planning, were all under budget on the salary side. And again, just shows you materials, things you're, you're purchasing like gravel fuel is what that is, and different parts and then contracted services are all the contractors that you're hiring in the year. Um, and then provision for allowance. That's the one thing I wanted to point out on that page. That's where it's clearly shown that this year we're allowing for potential uncollected receivables of 1.3 million. So just wanted to point that out. Uh, next page I wanted to make a few comments on is page 14. So here we're looking at the details of the actual accounts receivable. So these are you know amounts owed to the county at the end of December. And you'll see your first thing on the top of that list, right? Property taxes, 3.6 million compared to last year, 1.9. So we, we have a handful of, of oil and gas companies that, that most of that balance relates to. Uh, so that's the gross number, that's what people owe you. And then a few lines down, you'll see the allowance up to 1.7 million from last year. We started allowing for some of these issues. Uh, like obviously the dollars were a lot smaller. So now we've gone another year and we've allowed for all of it. Uh, and certainly that doesn't mean that, you know, management is not, you know, we're not stopping trying to collect. It's just saying we're making an accounting entry because collection is uncertain. So uh, no amounts are actually being written off your books. It's all, it's all still there. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, maybe all the way to page 18. So we talked about your surplus. Here I'm pointing to, or I'm looking at uh, note number 12, accumulated surplus. So again, we have a total that we've talked about, the 65.1 million. That gets split into three different buckets. I mean, the bulk of your accumulated surplus is tied up in your capital assets, you know, your land, buildings, equipment, infrastructure. Uh, so that's 59.8 million of your surplus. The other numbers are more important in terms of what you have available to work with. So you'll see the restricted surplus really hasn't changed a whole lot from last year, 8.3 million. But the, the top line of that note, the unrestricted surplus has flipped into a deficit for the moment. Uh, again, primarily because we're making an entry to allow for those potential uncollected taxes. That, and you also paid for your capital asset additions during the year, primarily with, with operating type revenue. Um, and I understand that management has a plan uh, in 2020 that to take out additional debt to cover that um, and make motions to move items from reserve to, to ultimately cover this deficit. So, so the deficit, I just wanted to point out the deficit really relates to those two things. Um, so 
those are our comments on the financials. On the very last page, just wanted to point out page 21, we've added a subsequent event note number 20 there, note number 20. Uh, so this is now a standard note that's getting added to financial statements that are being issued ever since this COVID thing started to happen. It's just a statement saying, you know, that us management, you know, council, everybody is, you know, at this point, we don't know what the impacts will, will be long term. Uh, it's just making a statement in, in that regard. So I just want to know that's a standard note we're putting in every financial statement. So those are our comments on the audit, the financials. I don't know if that raises any questions for anyone. Doesn't sound like it. Okay. You want a I need a motion to accept the auditor's report. Prove it. Sorry. Nick, all in favor? Against? Okay. Well, thanks, Curtis. All right. Thanks, everyone. It, uh, it doesn't look like we're going to, we don't have to sell the farm yet, so that's good. No, not just yet. No. <laughs> Already. Okay. I'll get to see you at the the AGM, the St. Anne Gas AGM, probably. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Right on. Oh, Mike. Hey, Kurt, are you still there? No, I think he's gone. Tristan, I thought you wanted to see. Yeah, I didn't know if he would have any specific comments to FCSS in relation to the audit presentation, and it didn't seem that he did. So we can speak to my item whenever the Reeve is ready to do so. Now would be just absolutely perfect. I'm sorry you cut out. Did you say now would be perfect? <laughs> yeah, no, now would be good. Okay. So let me just pull the item up here. Okay, so the um, Community Services Department has completed our FCSS program report uh, and forwarded it off to our auditors as they are required to submit a review engagement report to accompany it when we submit it to the province. Um, and so both those documents are attached for your information. And it's simply just a request to receive it as info as well. Okay. There is a small surplus, but that will be asked to be retained into the next year. Okay. I need a motion to accept. Lloyd, all in favor? Against? Okay. Carry on. I'm getting there. Uh, so the next item is E1, which is Camp Warwa funding request. Uh, so they were looking at uh, completing a, a big construction project on a dining hall uh, and did receive a substantial grant from CFEP to do so. However, because of COVID-19, they are forced to um, close their operations for camps at least until the end of June is what they're looking at right now. They don't know if that will continue into the rest of the season or not, um, but that does play a significant impact on their excuse me, their revenues coming in. And so they reached out to the county to see if we would be interested in partnering um, and providing some funding into the project. At this point, administration's recommendation is to receive it for information and continue to work with them to see what their specific request is and bring back for consideration at a later date. Their correspondence didn't give a specific number and with um, revenues unknown, I'm not sure that we want to make that substantial of uh, a commitment until we're further into the year. So the recommendation is in front of you basically to receive the correspondence and to continue working with them to get additional information. Okay. Nick. Well, I'm just ready to move, make a motion okay. to, to accept the uh, information, uh, <laughs> accept it as information and then, uh, advise administration to move forward. <laughs> well, okay, all in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Okay. Next. 
Here is the uh, private campground operations. So um, we have been continuously monitoring any announcements from the province in relation to uh, private campground operations. At this point, there is nothing to prevent the campgrounds from operating as a business. Um, there's no restrictions that have been put in place. There are some recommendations that are coming from a, a few different sources, primarily uh, the Canadian Campground Association, um, which will be recommended that private campgrounds follow uh, if they choose to operate. But at this point, the recommendation uh, to Council is that we simply issue a statement um, that we are not going to interfere with the operations of privately owned and operated campgrounds, that the Chief Medical Officer of Health is the expert in this situation, and we will follow any advice that or restrictions that come from her. So simply to defer those recommendations to the province via the Chief Medical Officer. Okay, you want a motion on that? Yes, please. There's a recommendation in front of you. Uh, yeah, you're right. There is if I look up on the screen. <laughs> okay, Steve. You're not on. Turn your mic on. We're good. All right. Um, coming in clear. Trista, have we had any concerns or uh, through our... Uh, from our residents about having our private campgrounds open or, or any counselors? We've had inquiries. Um, I wouldn't say that they're concerns. They're just simply, is the county going to operate either the municipal campgrounds, um, which is the majority of our calls, or are we going to allow the privates? But there hasn't been any formal, I guess, opposition to opening just inquiries yeah uh, i've had one the lipas in uh sunset or well right at the border of sunset point and stuff for a little concerned about that big campground at gun opening up but it's pretty tough to like i said you you're, you go to alberta beach to get your groceries and all the rest of it and alberta beach is opening up their campground so their municipal campground so it's kind of yeah, it's different across the, the province, both municipal and private. Some are opting to open, some are opting to delay opening, and some are saying, no, we're closed. Uh, for the majority that are opening, they are putting limitations in place or restrictions on the mass gathering areas. So no washroom facilities, no playgrounds, no um, trails, those kinds of things. But for the majority, like I said, it's, it's an individual choice to open and uh, they're operating as a, as a business, as any other business within the county. George. Uh, Trista, um, I got no problem sending them a letter. Should we maybe though in that letter just include in case they don't have it, what the provincial guidelines are? Certainly, we, we definitely just... can. I did uh, include in the agenda item the, the draft statement. Um, and we can definitely put that in. Uh, what I have in the proposed statement at this point is just a link to um, the Alberta COVID website, just so that we make sure that they have the most current information. I'd hate to send something out that changes, you know, in three hours. Uh, I wonder if we have to, uh, or ask them to make sure they hand one out to all their campers, but I guess that's maybe not necessary. That should be their responsibility anyhow. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, did you, I just said something that I got from Getson to everybody. Did you guys get it? From the private campground stuff? Did you get it, Trista? I did, and that's the same message that's being shared across basically these are the recommendations on if you're going to open you need to have your risk mitigation strategies in place you need to ensure that you have the adequate means to enforce um and the recommendation that you know the the larger facilities within your campground remain closed right okay and self-contained so no uh, most places are no tenting or anything like that you're in your self-contained units 
Okay, I need a motion because we didn't get one of them yet, did we? To send a letter. I don't believe so. George? All in favor? Opposed? There we go. Okay, I think we're done with you. Thank you, guys. You're what? Uh, 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 anyway. Mr. Martin. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Eve and uh, fellow members of council. This morning, I get the privilege and the honour of uh, presenting uh, the draft and summary operating budget for you. Am I coming through okay? What? <laughs> so the process... No, you're good. Uh, great to hear. Um, the process started last August. So when I first uh, arrived on the county scene, we are in budget mode and... Uh, Several drafts later, nine or so, I guess, to be specific, uh, we're here to produce a product for you and to the public uh, that we should be very proud about. As Curtis had spoken to uh, a few minutes ago regarding our financial position, uh, this budget tried to capture that as well and maintain a strong financial uh, uh, position as well. And uh, I think it's one that uh, Council should be happy with. And uh, I'm just going to very go over some of the key highlights. Uh, so I'll, I'll get into the presentation here. On, uh, so on December 13th, Council, you passed that interim operating budget. It was 50% of the prior year operating budget expenditures, which is a 16 million plus change, excluding one-time purchases. And that was allowable under Section 242 of the Municipal Government Act. And that acted as the interim budget. It ceases to have any effect after the time the 2020 operating budget is adopted by council. So hopefully today uh, that uh, that interim budget uh, that we had passed goes away. As per section 242, each council must adopt an operating budget for each calendar year. So it's under legislation as you are very well aware of. Uh, council had directed administration to bring a balanced budget back once uh, the 2019 assessment for 2020 taxes were finalized and sit submitted to asset that was due on a on February 28th. And, and as well as uh, many discussions regarding tax rate, which were completed in the past month or so. I'm not going to get into all the contents of the operating budget section 243. Uh, uh, I'm not going to read verbatim what that says, but basically it, uh, operating budgets required to have the estimated amount of expenditures and transfers, so things like uh, so things like uh, debt, uh, requisitions, reserve uh, transfers, that sort of thing, as well as funding all the expenditures required. Uh, our budget definitely has those. Subsection two goes on to say that uh, that the sources of revenue and transfers must also be uh, identified. Those are things like taxes, various taxes, as well as uh, grants user fees and reserves and that sort of thing. Uh, subsection three talks about uh, the, the requirement or not the requirement to have to budget for amortization. So it's not a requirement. Uh, we put it in our budget to show it, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's not a requirement uh, under the MGA. So that's sort of the, the framework of the rules that we are, uh, are up against when we produce an operating budget. Then getting into the, the heart and the meat and potatoes of it. So this year we had net, and I used 2019 and 2020 as a comparative. Um, I broke it into three separate categories based on our org chart as to how we have our, our, set, our setups in our departments. So the first one being legislative administrative, the second one being community and protective services, and the third one being infrastructure and planning. So in 2019, legislative services had roughly $4.4 million, which represented 22% of the budget. Community and protective services had about 2.975, which represented approximately 15% of the budget. And infrastructure and planning, the biggest, $12.7 million, roughly 63.1% of the budget. And uh, in 2020, legislative services and administrative services went down slightly, 
it went up according to the dollar figure, but down as a total representation of the total percentage of uh, $4.4 million roughly expended. So roughly about the same percentage or so same uh, dollar figure. Community and protective services went up slightly uh, to $3.1 million and infrastructure and planning went up as well to about $3.2 million in total. We're looking at expenditures of $20.8 million. And when you take the depreciation out of there, which is uh, not cash budgeted for, we have a total net expenses, less depreciation of $16.7 million is our total operating expenditure budget uh, net, uh, of which is funded through taxation. Overall, the legislative and administrative services seen a net increase of about 24,000 or about 0.5%. The biggest increase was in the area of communication as we added some enhancements in that area, offset by savings in some of the other areas like general administration and legislative services. Community and protective services had seen an increase of about 141,000, represents about a 4.7% increase over the previous year. The biggest increases were in the areas, and not in no particular order, were in the areas of ag services. And that was due to the provincial funding cuts with the grant and the need to put the municipal dollars back in to maintain those service levels. As well as recreation, there was approximately $105,000 increase. This was mainly due to the reduced revenue due to the economic conditions, plus some additional contract services that were required to maintain those services. Having said that, there was some savings in the area of fire departments of about 52000 which is the result of a debenture being paid off, which was funded originally from operating dollars. So there was a bit of savings in, the, in those areas. As far as infrastructure and planning, we've seen an increase of about $570,000 net, which is an increase of 4.5%. The largest area uh, an increase was seen in the area department area of transportation, which is the biggest budget in the county. The debt repayment of, on new borrowing, approximating 400000 above the prior year, is the biggest change to that. So I was easily explained. There was savings, some savings in the fleet department, largely on inventory items, including fuel. And there was also some net increase savings, or some, sorry, some net increases in shoulder pulls and special projects, but there was also some savings in dust control in other areas. There was also some other increases in the GIS and towers areas with some efforts in improving our communications, as well as additional engineering to update the county road study and for asset management. But there was, also, but there was some recognized savings in plan, planning and development. And that shows, all of those show on the schedule, the net departments, which uh, you can flip to uh, on one of the other schedules. There is also a funding shortfall due to estimated bad debts by approximately 260,000 from the uncertainty of tax collection in 2020 and to deal with unfunded bad debts from 2019. The remaining 2019 write-offs were funded from operating reserves, but are only a short-term measure in dealing with this bigger issue. So we definitely had to deal with some of our issues. We had to deal with our deficit from the prior year, which we funded through operating reserves as a sort of a band-aid effect. So you're going to see the effect of that in 2020 in order to balance this year's budget. There were no provisions in this budget to reduce staffing as there was no need to do so. In order to maintain its current service levels, it needs staff to run these programs. Many of the layoffs that we'd seen in other municipalities have large recreation facilities that were required to be closed during this pandemic, which did not require staff to run programs in empty buildings, which made layoffs a cost-effective decision from their perspective. Lac St. Anne County simply doesn't have these type of facilities. All net department increases were funded through taxation, primarily through assessment, both through growth and market. In summary, there was growth of approximately $60 million. So that was new, new uh, growth to the assessment. And approximately 71 million was a result of market value and inflation, uh, which had sales data to support that those increases. This resulted in approximately $1, $1 million in additional revenue. 
In addition, a 0.5 residential increase was necessary to raise the necessary shortfall and balance the budget, which was approximately $43,000 in funds. So also in this package of, uh, of yours, it contains uh, operating budget line by line detail, as well as the grant schedule, reserve schedule and long-term debt. And I'll just speak to them just briefly. On the grant funds, the county is proposing to use about $2.6 million in MSI capital this year and $1.7 million in federal gas tax funds, as well as 100,000 in MSI operating and 143,000 in STIP funds. So that's kind of on the side as far as what we're pro using for grant funding. And it does tie into op capital, but I flow, we flow those, uh, those grants through the operating budget. For reserves, there is approximately 1.6 million used for budgeted projects with approximately $1 million going into reserves. So a net probably of approximately 600,000 being used from, from reserves and some of those of which are to fund last year's deficit. For new debt in 2020, county is borrowing approximately 1.4 million for multi-projects from 2018 and 19. Paddle Dam and Township 540, as well as Sangudo, and will increase the principal repayments to 883,164 in total, and still with which with what with which is well within our debt limit. So that doesn't include the Laxane and Foundation, um, I believe. The the multi-year budgets of 2021 to 2023 are also included as part of this package as part of the financial plan required under the section 283 of the MGA. But of course, there's more specific detail included in the schedules of this report. And that uh, concludes my high level summary of the 2020 operating budget. That, um, I've got one question for you, Mike. Is that supposed to be Township Road 540? I, I will. So. Is that 590? Let me just check on that, Joel. Let me get back to you. I will pull that up quickly here once. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's in regards to the borrowing you're asking about, Joel. Yeah, it yeah. is Township, Township Road 540. 40 on the bylaw township for 540 we were going to borrow 95,000 on it so that is 540 what were we doing on 540 sorry it just doesn't was that share with silver sands was that paving? oh okay that makes sense yeah when we did that paving with silver sands yeah okay. Okay. okay yeah thanks carla Okay. I just, I just yeah, wanted ahead, to give, buddy. I just wanted to give a big thanks out to all the staff who went through the the, the meetings with us, put forward a, a good honest budget, as well as council for leading the way through this process. Uh, of a lot of this information, we should have this shouldn't be all new to you, as we've been through several drafts. And uh, thank you for all your leadership, uh, getting us through to where we are today. Nine drafts. You already reminded us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so. Somebody on or off. What are we, uh, do we want a motion to accept that for information? Approval to approve the operating budget. Where am I out here? Okay, I'm yeah. right here. Sorry. I, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll move that. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Opposed? There you go. That's, uh, so that was 9A1. Yeah. Thank you, Council. Right. And two. 9A2 is the 2020 capital projects budget. So section 245 of the municipal government act states that a council must adopt a capital budget for each calendar year. 
section 246 uh, includes the contents of that budget, which includes the amount, A, the amount they need to acquire, construct, remove, or improve capital property, B, the anticipated sources and money to pay for the costs referred to in Clause A, and uh, C, the amounts transferred from the operating budget. So Council was presented a draft 2020 to 2029 capital budget at the December 13th meeting of, uh, for review. There was also a review of the 2020 capital budget on February 27th. The only changes that were made from each from that draft that you recall was 2019 projects not completed were carried forward. So there were several bridge files that were still needed to be carried forward as well as the spray truck, as well as uh, other amounts carried forward on the Paddle Down project, Township 590 and Sangudo Meters project. So there was a few projects we had to add once we got the information from our uh, respective departments that needed to get uh, added forward. So those were a few of the, just the cleanup changes. And those were, of course, were already funded. For 2020, the only pert changes was adding the Corsair Air Cove emergency access as well as expected greater purchases estimated cost revised based on the economics, 472000 revised to 450000 There's also the purchase of the medical center of for 700000 as well as a new tower site for the land purchase of about 10240 240. So those are the, the, the changes from the February 27th meeting that we had uh, regarding the direction for the capital budget. So just in summary, the uh, 2019 carry forward projects, so a total of 4.379 million is being carried forward from 2019 to 2020 for completion. And they'll be funded from the following sources, reserves $282,280, grants $561,600, and debt $3,485,495. Other contributions, that's other municipality contributions of 50000 to fund all of that capital for 2019. For 2020, the, the new capital projects, total of $3.4 million is spent approximately, 266000 of which will come from reserves, grants, primarily the MSI, federal gas tax, $2.0 million roughly from grant funded. Debt uh, seven hundred thousand. That's to fund uh, the medical, the dementia for or the fund uh, loan for the medical center and the sale of assets. Um, when we flip out our uh, our stock, is about five hundred three thousand dollars to fund that. And uh, the twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty nine capital plan is also attached as an attachment, as per section two eighty three of the municipal government act. Um, it's a required a ten year plan is required. And we meet those uh, meet those requirements. So I'll leave that with council. But uh, the the recommended action is to accept the 2020 capital pro uh, project budget as well as the 2020 29 capital plan as presented. Okay. Do you want two separate motions on that? Mike? Yes, please. Yes, please, uh, Reed Blakeman. Okay. Um. So I need, can I get a motion on the, the 2020 capital project budget to accept that? Nick, all in favor? Opposed? And then we want uh, the 2021 uh, to 2029 capital projects, the draft budget on that, right? Correct. Motion to accept that, please. Lloyd, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Th thank okay. you, Council. Yeah, Mike, I think you guys did a good job too when we asked you to get that budget down to um, where we needed to be. You guys worked your butt off and went through it all, all the staff to get it so we didn't have any major increases anywhere. So. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Is that it with you for now? Yeah. You're back special, up here in a minute. Yeah, special thanks goes out to Carla for all the work she put through as well.
So thank you, Carla. Big finance support. Okay, Mike. Done. Oh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I put this on the agenda. Um, I've been on the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance Committee for probably the last two years. Uh, this uh, alliance has been in effect probably for close to 10 years in regards to um, basically looking at the betterment of the Sturgeon River watershed and its riparian area and everything. So uh, basically uh, the Sturgeon River watershed in support for water or life, which is an Alberta strategy for sustainability, um, the Sturgeon River watershed is, is, is a recognized and valued prairie river system. So uh, it connects uh, not only uh, all the land from uh, west of Lake Isle all the way to the North Saskatchewan River, it connects uh, a lot of uh, agricultural communities, uh, urban communities, and also adds to the quality of life for the region. Uh, outside of that, the area has a rich history and uh, today supports uh, not only the large agricultural, but a growing urban presence. So unfortunately, some changes that have happened over uh, the continuous years to the basin's natural land cover, uh, which has turned to other uses, it has affected the Sturgeon River watershed. And in this case, this is what this alliance does. It takes a look at those changes, takes a look at some of the issues that are um, hampering the health of uh, the Sturgeon River. And at the same time, um, basically has uh, contractors people um, that live in and around the area um, who are contributing uh, information to this, uh, basically the viability and the health of the Sturgeon River. And what this alliance then does is takes a look at all those and comes up with uh, certain either projects or policies and plans to align to support a healthy watershed um, it wants to make sure that all residents have access to safe, secure drinking water and uh, whether it's on public or private. And at the same time, it in, enhances the aquatic eco ecosystems. Um, the importance of water is, is how can I say, <laughs> you can't discuss the importance or, or argue the importance of water and the importance of the quality is recognized of and re reliable quality drinking water is made available not only to the people but to livestock and it also supports a sustainable economy. So making wise land uses and uh, ensures that the cum cumulative effects of growth and development are, are managed and mitigated and that residents and stakeholders support the Sturgeon River Watershed Management Plan. So I'm uh, making a motion that uh, what we do as a council is that uh, the count Laxena and County uh, accept the Sturgeon River Watershed Management Plan 2020 uh, for information and that we resolve to continue to work collaboratively with other municipalities and the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance uh, to either implement plans and at the same time uh, to consider plan recommendations in the decision making of the municipality including the development of new and updated statutory or other documents that may come into effect. This does not say that we have to agree with it, but we would discuss it. And if it works favorable for our county, we would then agree to help support it. So that's my motion, uh, Reeve Lakeland. Okay, any discussion on that? Yeah, Joe, uh, to Nick, is this gonna cost us any money? Or have we budgeted for this or is there what?
I think we're good. We're going to get back at her and see if we can carry on here. So, bylaws and policy, policies. We are at uh, six. Chair Hill, special tax. Yeah, Mr. Chair, this here is a special tax for the uh, improvement that we did to the sewer system in 2003 in Chair Hill, and it's an annual bylaw. Uh, where the residents pick up 50% and we, the county picks up the other 50%. Okay. Steve, you're not on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Joe? Yeah, yeah. In regards to that uh, tax or the special levy tax, and that's been since 2003. The money that's where it's funded from is it the wastewater fund? From uh, the yes, I believe it is. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Um, the, the can I cut in here? I can't I hear you, Mike. The money is from reserves that we funded, and the amount going at the end of 19 is $92,812. Final payment will be twenty. Correct. I understand that. Now, just a question. Is it possible that we um, forgive that uh, levy on the condition of using the wastewater front um, that we've done to apply on a construction of a line of $490,000? Can we use that wastewater reserve to pay off that debt? I'd, I'd recommend we don't. We're already paying 50% of that debt as, a, as the county. The residents are picking up only 50% of the cost. For the I can't quite hear you, Mike, but the, I think I understand what you're saying. But the point being is that the capital cost, which is a capital cost, we are funding a capital cost wastewater from our current reserves why could we not apply that same principle to the chair hill special levy tax uh i guess the comment would be that this is a infrastructure that has been in place for 17 years and the wastewater tax has been collected since i think 2010 or 11. i can't hear i can't, I can't hear. hear you mike i really don't know Okay, is that better? There, yeah, that's yeah. good. There you okay, go. sorry. Uh, the wastewater tax uh, was started collection in 2010, 2011. That's for the new, um, I would argue. And this infrastructure that was put in the ground was 17 years ago. So I'm not sure that we want to use the, the infrastructure reserves for this when it's been in place already with an agreement to have it paid back by 2031. And they're only paying 50% of the cost of it, not 100%. We're Understood. already subsidizing it. Understand, but each of the residents there are paying roughly about $80, $80 a lot. Uh, that currently, that at this point in time, uh, would be a substantial benefit to the, those residents, but uh, in reducing the overall cost in the long term. Most of these people are seniors that live in that area or live in that hamlet. I, I have nothing more to add. If council wants to, to take this on, that's fine. It, it can come from anywhere. Okay. It's just an annual bylaw. Hold it. Um, let's just get some clarification here. So we collect so much in, in Cherry Hill, and I've been since they put it in. I remember every year we have had a bylaw. And so they, have, they, they collect it for the exact financial instrument of what was covered on, right. a, you know, on that basis. And that's on their property. Is that that's uh, not? Did they pay for their hookup to their individual property, or did we hook them up? The distribution to their property was it just to the property line? But my understanding is, is we did the complete hookup. We only we did to the property line uh, when the new service was put in. We didn't. They were already existing. They there were already, existing. That's right. Yeah. It was a repair on an old, an old line that 
this came came about. I, I, I actually, yeah, I, I remember when it was it was done and it was repaired, but I wasn't. My understanding was is they made sure it all was retrofitted and working. But the the point is is the money we covered from the Chair Hill area goes specific to the Chair Hill system. The money from San Gudo goes on to their utility bill as well. San Gudo has their own utility bill. I, I and, totally understand that, Lauren. Uh, uh, the, the key there is that so, we're using wastewater funds to support a new structure. And no, this it doesn't go into the big pool. It goes into their pool. Sharon Hill pays for Well, if you I, understand I understand it, that. I understand the $80 that goes in to pay off the debenture. Of well, our, our residents, other residents pay into this too. A hundred and, you know, there's a, there's a utility. It varies rates all over the county. Now we've yep. accumulated a pool to for capital projects. Now we're going to. Well, you know, the, I, I, okay. It I, is a capital and infrastructure that yeah, it's been financed and it's been debentured and and then we're looking at a. A situation it'll be probably a few more water lines that are going to be built which is done by capital um, using our we could be using our wastewater whatever we do to put up for that 10 percent i'm just seeing if whether the council would accept the fact that ninety two thousand dollars would be a, a a project or a, a to facilitate uh this uh that we have that 22 roughly whatever number is left in that reserve is where I'm coming from. They will, Lauren, also they will continually spend, I think it's 20 or $30 a year that they do pay through the, the uh, wastewater tax that we have currently. Can I oh, say I know something we're, here? Yeah. Okay, just the so wastewater lagoon tax, we have to remember too, it's, it's collected for the lagoon systems and not for the sewer systems. So we can just use it on the lagoons and not, and not uh, specific sewer systems like Sure Hill. That's correct. Okay, thanks, Carla. Uh, and that, how does that apply on the uh, uh, capital cost on the wastewater line that's going from Onaway to Sandy, the capital that we've approved because that's a force me on that one. Oh, but isn't it isn't that tax triggered or identified as for lagoon and repairs to the lagoon? <clears throat> that's where I'm. That's my point. I think it's what it is. Is it offers a collection system, Steve? for a number of residents that do not have any collection system right now. So they'll be paying, if anybody's hooking up, they are a customer and customers pay, usually they pay, sometimes they pay a monthly bill. Some people pay on a yearly bill or on a, uh, or a monthly prepaid plan. Utilities aren't free. Uh, no. Yeah, Nick. I, I, I think we have to be fairly cautious with regards to, if we're going to be using utility modeling, uh, we have to be very cautious about where we're going to be providing credits or discounts to, you know, to any kind of rate payers, uh, because it then puts the onus on, on the balance of the people. And in that case, I, I believe it's unfair for those people. But to me, the thing is, is that if we're going to be use, utilizing a utility model, it's as uh, Councillor Olsevik said, you know, everybody needs to pay for it. It's just a matter of, Huh? Who said no? <laughs> but anyway, to me, the thing is, is that I think we have to be cautious about uh, offering credits. Well, we've got to be careful on O&M because we're charging everybody that's using the North 43 Lagoon. All of them people over there in Corsair Cove and Gun and stuff <laughs> are all paying O&M charges for the, on their, for the year. So I think we better just stay away. I know what you're after, Steve, and I get it, but I don't think it's the proper place for it. Okay, uh, I just wanted to make that point. Now I can understand, but I, when we can go further uh, down the road, because I think utility model is something we need to work on, uh, because we have the wastewater and water lines coming in. So we need to discuss that or get that something down the road that we need to 
discuss. But well, I that's think, fine. I think I, we've gone down the road with this utility model. Uh, we've been working on it for a long time. Uh, San Gudo was the first. And San Gudo has a bill and it goes out every month to every resident. And they're paying their utility bills. And they have done. And they make sure that uh, their, their infrastructure that they have there uh, is supported through their utility bill. The uh, the um, uh, the lagoon that your, that uh, San Gudo has would be covered on a new build where nobody's hooked up. There are no utility customers. When you create the utility, that's when everything uh, kicks in because now you have customers. And that utility model, I Joe has worked on it for a lot of years. Uh, we've had lots of people working on this utility model, and we've had all kinds of consultants on it. And so I think we're down the road long ways on this utility model, and it isn't going to go away. It's here to stay. Thank you. Well, fair enough. I, I just got to get a better understanding of the utility model, but that's for my research. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, can I get a, we need to get this bylaw, so I need a first reading. Um, George, um, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. Second reading? Lauren. All in favor? Okay, that's as far as we can go. Can we? We can't, can we? No, no, you just need uh, unanimous consent. You need a majority to say you unanimously can go forward. Regardless of if it's four, three, five, two, oh, six, okay. one. Yeah. You All still right, sorry. I thought we had to wait a day or wait till the next meeting. Sorry. Unanimous consent. Ross. All in favor? Opposed? Third reading. Nick. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay. Confused. Sorry, guys. Next. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the next one is bylaw 07 2020 wastewater special tax. And this is where we, uh, every resident, uh, improved all recreational properties is $125 per property. Uh, all recreational vacant is 30 and uh, the all resident properties uh, not improved are 20. Okay. All right. I need first reading. Lloyd, Lauren. all in favor? Okay. Against? Second reading? Lauren. Lauren, all in favor? Against? Carried. Unanimous consent. Steve, all in favor? Carried. Third reading. Nick, all in favor? Carried. Okay. Thank you. Now, you're welcome. Number eight, bylaw 2020, Onaway, Lake Santa County, ICF. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as discussed previously, this is the bylaw for the ICF with Onaway. This template is different um, than the one for the Summer Village. Um, this is the proposed version that we're doing with all the villages. Um, you know, Alberta Beach, as well as indicated, they're in favor of it. It's just um, some of the other things they want to flush out. Um, this bylaw in its current form has already been approved by the town of Onaway, and we are requesting that it gets... Uh, Three readings and unanimous consent today. Okay. That's good. We're getting them down and beat up. Out first of the way. Reading, Lauren. Lauren, first reading. All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Second reading. Nick? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Unanimous consent. George? All in favor? Opposed? Third reading. Steve, all in favor? Okay, carried. There we go. Number nine, 
Tax rate bylaw. Mike Morton, is you talking to this? Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Reeve. Um, the recommendation here is to approve all three bylaws of bylaw 14, 20, 20 uh, tax rate bylaw as presented. And that's in accordance with uh, section 353 of the Municipal Government Act. The property tax rate bylaw is prepared annually in order to establish property tax rates to fund the remaining portion of the budget that is not covered by user fees, government transfers, or other revenue sources. So there is a 0.5% increase to the municipal rate being recommended for 2020, and it's uh, in our budget as, as approved already. The impact of this means that a residential home with an assessed value of 350000 in both 2019 and 2020, the municipal residential taxes will increase $17.50 for the year. This does not include the requisition amounts that the county collects on behalf of the province that includes education, as well as the St. Lac St. Anne Foundation and the new police requisition. More detailed breakdown of these taxes will be available upon request. One change relating to assessment classes and to be consistent with the subclass bylaw involves the total assessed value of the new recreational condominium property is 11,833,200. That amount was previously lumped in with the residential improved total. It, it gets the same tax rate. The, pre, the presented bylaw is paired with already approved 2020 operating and 2020 capital budgets. It means the budgets are both balanced based on the rates presented in the bylaw. This bylaw will require three readings and unanimous consent. Otherwise, a special council meeting will be required to pass the bylaws. And uh, recommended action is to approve, all, give all three readings. Okay. I think that was pretty clear. Any comments? Okay. Can I get first reading? Lloyd, all in favor? <coughs> Against? Carried. Second reading, Lord. Steve, all in favor, <clears throat> against, carried, Lauren, unanimous consent, all in favor, against, carried, third reading, <laughs> Nick, <laughs> all in favor, against, carried. Okay, number 10. It's the property tax penalty bylaw 2020, 2020 dash 2020. <laughs> the count uh, recommended action is to approve bylaw 20 dash 2020 property tax penalty bylaw and give first, second and third reading to the bylaw. So there have been many measures taken by all levels of government to ease the financial burden on citizens due to the job loss and other economic hardship caused by COVID pandemic crisis. Black like St. Anne County is seeing direct effects here in the county and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic is having on our community and ratepayers. The county believes that deferring the penalty date from July 1st to September 1st will allow some time for ratepayers to arrange their finances and still be able to pay their taxes on time. Administration is estimating this interest cost to be approximately 35000 The due date for taxes will remain June 30th and the county hopes that residents will pay by that date and if they have the ability to do so. But that, with that said, the penalty dates will actually be September 1st, which will be applied at 6% originally from July 1st, and then November 1st will be 9% originally from October 1st. And the recommended action is to give all three readings. Okay. <clears throat> Steve, first reading, all in favor? Against? Carried. Second reading. George, all in favor? Against? Carried. Third reading. I mean, unanimous consent, sorry. Nick, all in favor? Against? Carried. Third reading. Lauren. Lauren, all in favor? Against? Okay, carried. There you go. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Council. Okay, 11, finance policy, purchasing and tendering. Okay, let me just pull this up one second. So,
So, just having a technical difficulty here. Okay, so the recommended action is the county rescind the policy 03 050 012 purchasing and tendering and approve the new policy 03 050 014 purchasing and tendering as presented. And further direct administration to update the government, uh, municipal government documents. So this was as a result of the review of the existing policy. We identified some areas of improvement that the administration is recommending to be implemented, and as well as discussion with legal and as part of our investigation uh, follow-up. In the purpose, we said that we should change the agreement to the actual Canadian Free Trade Agreement and the new West Partnership Trade Agreement and update the current legislation. So that's the actual framework of those agreements. The old one is uh, outdated. In number six, the list the RMA approved vendors as well as the option to accept tenders from suppliers out of province at the county's discretion to offer some flexibility. So before it was too rigid. So we, we could, it will allow us to more easily to look at these suppliers from out of province. If, if there's an opportunity to do so, we obviously do business in our province first. But if there's an opportunity, then we would at least give them all a, a chance to. In number seven, it, do not limit to transportation only. So that's building and other engineered structures may require it. So that should apply to all, all departments. And uh, number 10 is to uh, the clause to avoid prepaying for goods and services without possession or an ownership. And that came from the review recommendation. So it really puts emphasis on making sure that we're not over we, we don't pay ahead of time we actually get title to the and possession of that uh, good or service is what's really important there and number 12 was kind of a new clause in the entire section for disqualification so adding something adding would be something dealing with the right to disqualify bidders certain cases to reject bids proposals or quotes from contractors you've had problems with so that'll just help uh, in our own protection and so that's a summary of the changes that were made from the previous policy and the recommended action is to accept the policy as presented. Okay. Can I get a motion to accept the policy as so, presented? Just a or, question on that policy. Yeah, uh, so yeah. uh, we do have a, a detailed pre-qualifying uh, section in there, do we? Because you just said if something in the past, but in our pre-qualifying terms that yes. should already be identified that there are certain yeah. criteria of pre-qualification pre qualifications that's correct that's my understanding how we're dealing with the purchasing yes okay, perfect that's yes. the way that it's doing it. everybody does it now yeah, yeah, that's that's, best, yeah lauren we'll apply that when needed not for all but but it is there to allow us to do it yeah yeah because this free trade and all you know this western alliance that we're in we already experienced some of that and uh it wasn't that great of an experience, so uh, we want to be careful because it seems like they use it their way and we uh, were forced into something we didn't want. And I believe that was from, that was agreed upon. I think it's our RMA. Yeah. Okay. I need a motion. Nick? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Second for Hence, me. Carrie, you're second in it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you okay. go. All right. That's uh, that's it and that's all. Thank so, you, Council. Thank you, guys, for everybody that was on there and everybody that's out there listening in Radio Land. Thanks for joining us today. Adjourned. <laughs>